first lived in Latvia as a diplomat between 1996 and 1999, a few years after Latvia regained independence from the crumbling Soviet Union. I returned to live in Latvia in 2022. This podcast series is based on my observations and experience, with some history and comparisons with my home country of England on aspects of life in Latvia and things to see and experience. On Kuldiga. On a bright weekend at the end of September, I went to Kuldiga. The town was buzzing with people, strolling the cobbled streets, sitting at cafes, walking down to the waterfall. The small electric tourist buses were full. Why? Kuldiga had been added to the UNESCO World Heritage List a few weeks beforehand. In tourism terms, that is a huge thing. We will look at Kuldiga's journey to gain this designation. We will explore what you can see and do in Kuldiga. Come with me to Kuldiga, the small, unspoilt and beautifully preserved town in the west of Latvia. A very brief history of Kuldiga. Kuldiga is an ancient town in Latvia's western region of Kurtzeme, with a good location at the crossroads of trade routes, linking Prussian lands with Riga and Jelgava. It was first mentioned in 1242, when a Livonian order of knights' castle was built on the River Venter's left bank. The foundation of the Church of St Catherine was laid in 1252, St. Catherine is the patron saint of Kuldiga. At that time, Kuldiga was known as Goldingen. It joined the Hanseatic League in 1368. The Dukes of Courland decided to use the castle as their residence, and the town's economy grew from its trade with Riga and Jelgava by taxing goods across the bridge over the River Venta. In 1615, the bridge was destroyed by floods, which caused a massive loss of income to the town, and a fire ravaged the wooden buildings in the old town. Kuldiga's Annus Horribilis, a terrible year. The town was rebuilt around a new town square. The wealthiest residents and merchants built their houses around this, In the second half of the 19th century, industry started to develop, with small factories built. The largest factory was Vulcans, which produced matches from 1878 to 2004. Other factories produced needles, soap, cigars, vodka, beer and mineral water. Many new residential, municipal and public buildings were built in this period, including a new town hall, bridge across the Venta, German grammar school and the House of Latvian Society. The number of inhabitants doubled, reaching 13,000 by the First World War. It now has a population of about 10,000 people. to see in Kuldiga, a two-hour tour. The small river Alokshupitja runs through the centre of Kuldiga Old Town, along the walls of the houses, which have a distinctive architecture. Old, often wooden buildings in pastel colours, with red-tiled roofs on narrow cobbled streets, with the river flowing alarmingly close along the walls of some houses. The buildings are preserved in their original state rather than being recreated. 
On many, you can see the plaster hiding the cracks. They all look like they could do with a coat of paint. But actually, that adds to the character of Kuldiger. A perfectly preserved location, as it was, not by modern-day aesthetic standards. Kuldiger has lots of firsts. The old town, built around a small river, is the only one remaining in the Baltic states. A 4.2 metre high waterfall on the river Alokshupitja is the highest in Latvia. The Venta Rapid, a 249 metre wide natural waterfall, is the widest in Europe. Spanning the Venta is a brick bridge built in 1874, the longest bridge of this type in Europe. Has that whet your appetite to see Kuldiga? The town square is where you start your tour. Baznitsas Iela 5, if you're using a map or sat-nav. Like many such squares, this is the heart of the town and a gathering place. The town hall looks over it. The square is still the location for many festivities and exhibitions. Small, open electric buses start their tours from here. These have good suspension, which is necessary on the cobbled streets. A good restaurant, Goldigum Room, is on the square. It serves excellent pizza and other dishes. You can sit outside and watch the world go slowly by or sit inside in the quirky industrial architecture. The tourist office, with free maps, is on the other side of the square. By foot, see if you can find the oldest building in Kuldiga. It has a plaque on the wall, 1670, and isn't far from the square. Walk towards the castle pond and Duke's Gardens, the remains of the former castle and its grounds. When the castle existed, there used to be a moat connected to the river Alekshubitja and gardens that provided fruit and vegetables for the dukes living there, including Duke Jakob. Over the years, the castle has been destroyed, the moat was filled in and the gardens were reduced to pasture. However, the German grammar school located to the side of this area, took over the maintenance of the pond and park. At the beginning of the 20th century, it became popular for ice skating and sledging in winter. The students of the school provided hot tea for the skaters. In 2010-11, Kuldiger Council renovated the pond and a stretch of old wall and added a fountain and some sculptures. Go up the steps at the end of the park and view the majestic Venter Rapids from the high bank. Clock the length, 249 metres, the widest in Europe. As dusk comes, the rapids are illuminated. That might be a long wait, depending on what time you are there. Turn left and walk to the District Museum. This building is known locally as Bangert's Villa. It is not to be confused with the upmarket Bangers restaurant in the next door building. On the first floor upstairs, the first floor for the English, but the second floor for Latvians, the rooms have been laid out as an apartment of a wealthy resident in the early 20th century. Lots of small things to explore. When I visited... A tourist went through the linen in the bedroom cupboard. The floor above that has an exhibition on the history of the town. It is a great little museum, and the staff will happily explain things in English. But please leave the linen alone. It isn't a hotel. Then continue walking alongside the Venta, with its cafes and restaurants, until you come to the Brick Bridge. This was built in 1874, and at that time, it was the longest bridge in Europe, 
at 164 metres. It was made according to 19th century standards, 500 feet long and 26 feet wide, thus allowing two carriages to pass each other. It consists of seven spans of brick vaults. Oh, and on midsummer, local people run naked over it. Strange tradition. Cross the bridge and head down to the rapids. The Venter's Rumba is a naturally formed waterfall and at 249 metres is the widest in Europe. The sound is lovely. See if you can spot any salmon trying to jump the rapids. Spring is the best time for fish jumping. The waterfall is only about two metres high, so if you fancy a dip, it is relatively easy from the side you are now at. Head back over the bridge, refreshed if you did dip in the Venta, then cross the road to the small river Alokshupicha's waterfall. In the 17th century, Alokshupicha waterfall was artificially created to power the first paper mill in Kurtzeme. Oh, the locals have another race. This time, the competitors run along the bottom of the Alokshupicha River. Mad! Very close to the waterfall is St Catherine's Church, the oldest place of worship in Kuldiga. It was initially built in 1252, though it has been rebuilt in a Baroque style with plenty of wood carvings since then. St Catherine is the patron saint of Kuldiga. Walk back along Batsnitsa's Iela to Staffenhagen House. Forget the legend about King Charles of Sweden staying there and leaving a chest of clothes. It is simply not true. There is a beautiful built-in wooden cupboard and a closed chest that was added much more recently. But the best bit about this house is the kitchen. A square room at the back of the house. Look up as it leads through the house in a funnel shape to the chimney on the roof. An open fire hearth was used there for cooking as the only way to heat the house. Then it is a short stroll back to the main square. Tour completed. The Jews in Kuldiga. Something that is not mentioned in any of the official guides is the history of the Jewish community in Kuldiga. I do not know why. In 1800, 658 Jewish merchants and artisans lived in Kuldiga, Goldingen district, which was 15% of the population. In approximately 1801, the first synagogue was built and the first rabbi assumed office in 1826. By 1901, there were three private Jewish schools in the town, one for boys and the other two for girls. The languages of instruction at the school were German and Hebrew. At first, Kuldiger's Jews earned a living through small-scale commerce. From the end of the 19th century, their economic situation improved and the Jewish merchants sometimes supplanted the elite Baltic German business people. Jews built the flour mill and factories to manufacture matches and needles. By 1835, the total Jewish population was 2,330, some 57% of the population. In the second half of the 19th century, many Latvians came to the town and the Jewish community lost its majority status. With difficult economic and political times, Kuldiga's Jews began to emigrate, mainly to the USA and South Africa, via England. 
by 1935, the Jewish population had declined to only 9% of the town's 7,000 inhabitants because, during the First World War, the Jews were banished to the interior of Russia as suspected German sympathisers, and many community buildings and Jewish houses were destroyed. After the First World War, about a third of the Jews slowly returned to the town. However, during the Second World War, the Soviet Russians liquidated Jewish public institutions. Some of the Jews of Kuldiga escaped to the interior of Russia. Those who remained were murdered by Latvian fascists in nearby forests. By 1942, Kuldiga's Jews had been exterminated. This is a dark part of Latvia's history, and I'm surprised there is no official mention. Wikipedia and Jewish websites do tell the story of the Jews of Kuldiga. The former synagogue was one of the mo most significant buildings in Kuldiga. After the Jews were exterminated, the synagogue became a grain store, a cinema, then a nightclub after independence was regained, and now a town library. It is listed among the ancient buildings on the Kuldiga town website as the art house and library, and the listing mentions that it was a former synagogue. The Potato Cultural Field It's a strange but rather interesting story. On the bank of the Venta River at Parventa Park, a potato field was planted in 2019 where cultural potatoes grew. The potato field represented the poetry volume Kurzemitja, Little Kurzeme, by Latvian poet and writer Imans Ziedonis and the fact that Duke Jakob introduced potatoes to the Duchy of Courland. While the potatoes were growing, they listened to the potato field radio, which broadcasted poetry, plays, readings and music. People could also tune into the broadcasts. The potato varieties, Brasla and Magdalena, were planted with white clover and sunflowers. A beehive was placed in the middle of the potato field so that a person could lie down, listen to the potato field radio and experience a life best known to bees and potatoes. Unfortunately, something else also like potatoes and culture. In the summer of 2021, Colorado beetles attacked the potato crop. The staff at the District Museum told me that the field would be developed into a cultural place. Kuldiga Municipality confirmed that work was going ahead to build a watchtower on the site. I don't think to spot beetles. I had a look and a massive metal construction is being made. By the way, Kartupelu Lauku Radio, Potato Field Radio, continues and has a regular podcast in Latvian to celebrate everything to do with Iman Zidonis and other Kuldiga cultural people. <music> UNICEF World Heritage Status on the 17th of September 2023, at the 45th session of UNESCO World Heritage Committee, which took place in Saudi Arabia, UNESCO decided to add Kuldiga to the World Heritage List. This was the culmination of 25 years of work. Jana Jakobsone, head of the construction department of Kuldiga Municipality, led this work. She explained to Latvian Radio, one part is scientific research in various aspects, architecture, urban planning, landscape and the history of the Duchy of Courland. One part is practical research 
in which we visualise and write how and what to do in traditional construction, as well as with renovation and energy efficiency. And one part is the World Heritage Nomination File, which summarises the work of the last 20 years. You can read the nomination file on the municipality's website, kuldiga.lv. Kuldiga's Restoration Centre was set up as part of the UNESCO process to educate the public and involve people in restoration. I met Ilza Zarina, head of the restoration department, there. Ilza, thank you for spending time to, to talk to me. What was the inspiration to apply for UNESCO World Heritage status for Kuldiga, I think some 25 years ago now? I've been working in Kuldiga uh, for the municipality like for 15 years. But as far as I know that already historically during the Soviet time, the government of Latvia has appointed three historical centers, Riga, Tesis and Kuldiga. So already during the Soviet time, it was said that those places have particular historical value and the places have to be protected. In Kuldiga, they also have established like the conservation center. So they were people with some skills that were maintaining, especially the historical part of the town. There were clever architects working who also understood the special value and who didn't want to improve the, the, the status and the... Um, the situation of the old buildings, but they wanted to preserve as it is. And I've been talking with one young entrepreneur who was uh, restoring the house, and he said that architect uh, make him to to preserve the the, the angle of the, of the old old windows. He said that it's so necessary to have 90 degree angles that, that we have to consider the character of the old buildings that they might be shabby and, and they, they might be like on the right or on the left and it's not so important to make them straight. <laughs> UNESCO decision not so long ago was after lots and lots of work. What I, and we're in the restoration centre at the moment and undoubtedly the restoration centre did a lot of work in September gaining the status of World Heritage. What was that process like from, from your side? I know there have been lots of people involved, but what was that process? Was it quite long, lots of paperwork, or did UNESCO give directions as to what they wanted to, to see? So when we started to work on this uh, nomination file, sure we had to consider the, the statements and the value criteria, but apart from that, for us it was clear that wooden buildings and uh, wooden building details has very special importance. It was clear that the traditions, how to work with the wood and, and joinery of the old buildings, they were created in interaction of different nationalities. Because if we look at the style, we can't point that, that that's typical classicism style building or that's baroque style building. We see this impact of the, of the traditions, like folk traditions, those craft traditions of the, of, of the working with wood and joinery. And then we see the impact of the architectural styles that were popular at that time in Europe and the rest of the world. And then we also, when we analyze the, the building details, the door sets, we see that actually Kuldiga was rather long uh, period not connected to the railways. That it also means that electricity came rather late and also electrical instruments came rather late. So it means also that for rather long period, craftsmen, craftspersons, they were working with the hand tools and it also makes the, the, the character, the, the style of the wooden building details different. So, and uh, our center has been responsible for protecting the things because nowadays people, they have limited financial possibilities and if they think about maintenance of the building, they, they think that it's important that the roof is in good condition and, and also maybe they think about how to reduce the heat losses, but uh, they don't pay to, too much attention about the details. So the one of the priorities of our center is to protect all the details with particular art artistic value mm -hmm. that people don't 
don't maintain. So uh, like uh, such a, a rather simple detail as window shutters. Historically, it had uh, high importance because of the safety purposes. When you close the, the window shutters, nobody could uh, interrupt your, your family life. And nowadays, there's no meaning for that anymore. Mm -hmm. So people say, I don't need those window shutters. I am not going to invest money. Mm -hmm. And then our center is taking care because uh, I think that if we remove those window shutters, somehow the, the look of the building and all the architecture looks different. It's because the, that uh, window shutters it's, it, they play an important role in the composition of all building and in architecture. Also the door sets and, and some entrances like verandas or, or other parts that with like a smaller artistic value, that's the, the things we take care. Mm -hmm. But in general, I can add that uh, Kuldiga is a rather simple, if simple town. The architecture and the details, if you look at Latgale or Jormala to compare, then it's more so sophisticated in other places. And therefore I say that for Kuldiga, it's even more important to preserve what we have here. Mm -hmm difference in size as well. I mean, yeah, 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 big, exactly, um, There's yeah. a lot of modern development in Yomala as well as repairing yeah. of, of the old wooden villas. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, there's a nice, that was a nice description how you worked with residents uh, to convince them and help them to maintain the original structures of the buildings. What about businesses? When we started our work we were not paying too much attention who owns that building or, or mm -hmm. some parts with special value but we were emphasizing the, uh, the value itself so we, we were not so much considering who is the owner. It happens that we help to restore doors for some families living there or even also for the businesses. And then maybe those business people, they could react uh, faster because they, they had more investments. They could pay for the work and get the result faster. When our center is helping to some building, it's, it always takes a long time. It's not like there's big money and we do the restoration works completely. When we do the works, we try to save the special values. It's not like we want to renovate all the building. That's what we don't do. And for the businesses, we are giving a lot of consultations, mm -hmm. starting from the joineries companies. We explain them how to do the works, what's the traditional method, but not to do what's not the correct way and explain why. Because nowadays, those traditional crafts and skills are disappearing mm. because nowadays people build new houses according mm. different traditions. Mm -hmm. And they were, that's so important to explain people, not to say, not, don't do that, but explain what's, if you do in traditional way, what benefits do you get? So I think for the businesses, we, we play this consultancy role. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. And uh, also I would like to add about the residents, actually, mm -hmm. because we have a particular activity. We call it like maintenance of the wooden window frames because there's a rather high tension that uh, the simple um, understanding that how to save the heat is to put plastic windows and that's it. But in Kuldiga, according to our construction rules, that's not allowed. Mm -hmm. As a response, we, we offer people that they can come to our workshop, mm -hmm. they get paid all the materials, all the tools, we show them how to do the process. We have even created the videos on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go to YouTube and, and see what you will, the, we will expect people to do. And then they, can, they don't have to invest money, but just their time. So mm -hmm. they come to the workshop, yeah. we bring, help them to, to bring the frames and everything and show the process. And they maintain the windows and they can really improve the, the quality of the apartment or house. First it looks like, and then also from, from inside it looks... It looks nice and also it's not so noisy anymore because it's good fixation of the, of the, of the glass. Mm -hmm. So and also they, they enjoy the process first that they meet each other, they communicate <laughs> mm -hmm. and then yeah. they, they are getting like, like, how to say, guards of the town because they, they, they care about mm -hmm. And they and understand. Nice. Yeah, they understand excellent. and they feel like they are belonging yeah. to the town and yeah. they have improved and done something themselves. Yeah. Helps build the community. Yeah, yeah, it's really, that's yeah. important. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And then we also like uh, organize different, like smaller activities, maybe more inter entertaining and educational, like to our center, we invite families with children. Mm -hmm. We were celebrating Father's Day where people could come 
come and try those ancient tools mm. and to make wooden curls and they enjoy the process because children like to do yes. a lot of different practical things. They could yes. paint something and then they could fix this linen oil putty in the frame and they really enjoy and they could cut the glass and imagine not cut the paper but cut the glass <laughs> and so they were really fascinated. And then also we organized some activities where we explained that, that uh, actually wood is long-lasting material. And, and that's very green, not to not to destroy and create something new, but we can maintain wooden details for for long periods, like more like centuries. Mm -hmm. And that's what explain to people. And also we we give them different species of trees and and teach them how to recognize the fiber and also the smell and everything. And yes, just to enjoy the nature. And on the 17th September, when UNESCO made that decision that yes, Kudigo would be on the list of World Heritage Sites. Was there a big celebration in Kuldja? Was there a party? No, not exactly on that day. Actually, as, as a few days after we mm. got to get to know the, the news, we went uh, to the workshop in, in Norway together with the school in Zalenieki. They have mm -hmm. this department of restoration. So we were still improving our knowledge and improving our skills. So because we think that, okay, we, we got the status, but it's not the end, actually. That's mm -hmm. the maybe even more beginning of the process. So mm -hmm. we also share our knowledge as our masters are so good. We, we wanted these traditions to use traditional materials and this to tell about restoration process we promoted in other places in Latvia and also internationally and so we have good cooperation with with Norway and our Latvian people go there and we work together and it was specially devoted for the use of traditional instruments so I think people really enjoy the process mm -hmm. so our celebration was to get again new knowledge <laughs> mm -hmm. excellent yeah and uh, what next for Kuldiga? This is a journey, isn't it? I mean, the whole UNESCO process is really a journey. What next? What's the next big plans, the next big projects? So we are thinking about that we have to, to do, like, let's say, scientific research of our door sets. So far, we have been uh, renovated like more than 45 different doors, as you can see mm -hmm. the pictures also mm -hmm. here and yes. you, when you pass in the town. So we want to create a catalogue. We want to study and research more about the ancient masters who were working on those doors. So we want to research the history. And then we also want to describe the process, what we have done for 15 years. So because we think that when there will new generation come again, come after yes. us, that that might be interesting for them to know how we started and how we work on the process. And this is continuity of those uh, crafts tradition that we find that's important, that we pass the knowledge and still there's somebody who is interested in that. Thank you, Otsa. Yeah. In conclusion, the inclusion of Kuldiga on the UNESCO World Heritage List means that the unique value of this beautifully preserved old town has been recognised and that Kuldiga has been marked on the world map as an important cultural heritage site. Unlike some other sites of historical interest in Latvia, it does have the services to support tourists hotels and guest houses, small electric tourist buses, and guides one can hire, plenty of restaurants and cafes of a high standard, museums, sites, and things to see and do. There are signs in Latvian and English all over town. There are plenty of toilets and small car parks. It was buzzing with people enjoying themselves when I visited Go visit and see for yourself.